Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekoper. Today let's have a look at one of those classics from art history called The Oath of the Horatii. It was painted by Jacques-Louis David in 1784 and first exhibited a year later at the Paris Salon in 1785. At the time it was considered revolutionary and it was so incredibly popular and so many people wanted to see it that they actually had to extend the opening hours of the Salon just to give people the chance to see it. Today it's still seen as one of the first true neoclassical paintings, if not the first, and it certainly helped make that movement become popular. And besides that, it made Jacques-Louis David a household name in all of France. So let's have a look at it. By the way, in this video I'm going to use two different images of two different versions of the painting. You see, he made this original one, which is still in the Louvre in Paris, but that one is darkened over time, and oddly, I couldn't find any pictures of it where they were actually in focus, at least not to the extent that we can zoom in as far as I would usually do to show you all the details. Because you have to understand, I don't get to travel to all these museums that I talk about whenever I want to make a video. Usually I have to make do with what I can find online. And let's be fair, even if I could, I'm a terrible photographer, so I'm not sure I could do any better. But luckily, David himself made a copy, which is now in the Toledo Museum of Art in the United States. And there are plenty of high-quality pictures of that one. So often I will be referring to the second version rather than the first, and I think the only difference you will see is that the colors are somewhat brighter in the second version. Now, David, he painted this painting in, as I said, 1784, and he sent it into the Salon the next year. And if you're not familiar, the Salon was an art exhibition. It was a tradition that had started back in the 17th century, and the idea had been to boost the quality of French art. So artists were first invited to enter their work for the exhibition that was to be held in a series of rooms, or salons, in the Royal Palace in Paris, which is the Louvre. They were then judged, and various prizes would be given out by the king himself. And there were all kinds of different prizes. There were various medals that could be given for different genres of painting, for instance. But the main prize, the biggest one, was called the Prix de Rome. And that was an actual scholarship to study in Rome for five years, all expenses paid by the French king. Now, for David, this was far from his first entry into the Salon. Back in 1774, he had entered this painting called Erasistratus Discovering the Cause of Antiochus' Disease. It describes a classic story from antiquity where a young man falls in love with his young stepmother, but he can't act on it because, well, it's his stepmother. But he's so much in love that he becomes ill. His father, who doesn't know what's going on, has a doctor come over to examine his son. And here we see the doctor, who is feeling the pulse of Antiochus, when the stepmother walks in. And the doctor feels the reaction of the pulse and figures out what's going on. In the end, the stepmother ends up marrying the son rather than the father. Anyway, this painting was a success as well, and it won him that coveted Prix de Rome. So, for the next five years, he lived and worked in Rome. And when he got back, he was offered the use of an apartment in the Louvre, which was a privilege, of course, and a huge honor. There were actually several apartments in the palace that were used by artists. And while he was there, he married the daughter of the contractor for the buildings of the king, which may not sound like much of a title, but it, he was a very wealthy man. So th through the marriage, he actually became much richer than he had been before, and he started to move in the circles of the court, which is how he was commissioned by the king to make a painting about loyalty to the king. And that is why he started painting this particular picture. Now, the title is The Oath of the Horatii, and it refers to a famous episode from the history of Rome. Rome had been founded, of course, by the legendary Romulus and Remus, and after them, it became a monarchy that would, after some time, become a republic and then became an empire. But this is an episode from the time when Rome was still a monarchy ruled by a king called Tullus Hostilius. At the time, the city was, well, just that, a city-state. And they were at war with another city-state called Alba Longa, about 19 kilometers southeast of Rome. But instead of sending entire armies to kill each other, the two cities decided to fight this war through champion warfare. And this is a concept that pops up in ancient literature once in a while, and I'm not sure if it actually ever happened, but it's the idea that both armies select a champion, or in this case a group of champions, and they fight, and the outcome of that fight determines the outcome of the war. Another famous example is that of David and Goliath. 
But in this case, it was decided that both cities would send three men for this champion fight. And that was probably because both cities had prominent families that happened to have male triplets in the right age. On the one hand, in Alba Longa, there were the Curiaceae. And in Rome, they had the three brothers of the Horatii. This story, by the way, is told to us through Livy, who was a first century BCE writer who wrote a history of Rome. So, these two pairs of triplets were to fight each other, and in the fight, the three Curiaceae were wounded, but they did quickly kill two of the Horatii. Now, even though they were wounded, they were still much stronger than the remaining brother of the Horatii. So, he came up with a trick. He ran away, acting as if he was trying to flee. So the three Curiaceae went in pursuit, but because they were wounded, they couldn't run as fast. And in fact, they couldn't run equally fast as the other brothers because of their wounds, which meant that two of them fell behind pretty quickly. So then the lone Horatii brother could turn around and kill the one in front, and then he ran off again, with still two of the brothers in pursuit. But of course, again, one of them fell behind, so the Horatii brother could turn around and fight just one of them and win because his opponent was wounded. And eventually he would kill the last one. And here we can see the outcome of the fight on a large mural in the Palazzo dei Conservatori in Rome. By the way, that palazzo is now part of the Capitoline Museums. But the point is that David had most certainly seen this mural during his years living in Rome. And having studied Rome and its history for five years, he was most certainly familiar with the story. So, when the king asked him to paint a painting of loyalty to the king, this is what he came up with. Now, the scene itself is not mentioned by Livy. We see the three brothers, they're facing their father, as they apparently swear an oath. And that last bit we only know through the title, because what they're doing doesn't really look at all like swearing an oath. Because, as far as I know, in France, oaths were sworn by raising the right hand, and we have absolutely no idea how the Romans did it. So we see the three brothers raising a hand towards the swords held by their father. He, in turn, doesn't look at them, but seems to be addressing the gods. And then behind him, there are these three women who are in tears. And they actually have very good reason to be sad, because they are the sisters and the wives of the Horatii. And the problem was that the families of the Horatii and the Curiaceae were very close. One of the brothers was married to one of the Curiaceae sisters, and their sister, Camilla, was engaged to one of the Curiaceae brothers. So two of these women, the young ones in front, were going to lose loved ones no matter the outcome of the fight. And the woman in the back, she's usually regarded as the mother of the three brothers here, and she's comforting her grandchildren. So what's happening here is that they are sacrificing themselves for the greater good. Of course, if a full-blown battle between two armies would be fought, many more men would die. But now they have to fight their friends and relations through marriage and kill them or be killed by them. So what they're doing here is swearing loyalty to their state and their king above their family and their friends. And the story goes on after the fight. The one surviving Horatii, his name was Publius, he came home and he carried a cloak that his sister Camilla had woven for her future husband. So when she saw that, she realized that he had died and she cried. Publius saw that and immediately killed her, because he said it was a crime to cry over the defeated enemies of Rome. But he was then arrested and was sentenced to death for the crime of killing his sister. But he then appealed to the popular assembly, so basically the populace of Rome, and his father pleaded to the crowd that they should spare his son because of his heroic deeds and because he had already lost enough children, and they had a vote and they pardoned him. And instead of being killed, he would have to go under the sororium tiglium, which means the sister's beam. This was a beam shaped like a yoke that was erected on the Oppian Hill by his own father. And apparently this was to show his shame and to be shamed by the public for what he had done to his sister. Now, as I said before, the painting has been seen as the first real neoclassical painting. And there are quite a few reasons to say that. You see, at the time, or rather before that time, Rococo had been the most popular art style. It was a style that loves to show the lightness of things and is mostly about elegance and prettiness. This, for instance, is an early Rococo portrait painted by David. And in the Oath of the Horatii, everything is much more stern and direct. First of all, there's hardly any background. 
The backdrop is probably a house, but we hardly see any decorations. Also, the composition is set up in these three very clear parts. Those parts we can even see in the background in those three arches there. And each arch has a different group in the foreground in it. The one on the left has the brothers, the one in the center has the father, and the women are in the one on the right. And all these figures are placed closely together, almost as in a sculpted relief, which David would have seen in Rome, of course. We also see all the men in profile, which is the way we know the portraits of ancient kings and emperors and heroes, because we know their portraits mostly from coins. And there's this rigid and strictness in the composition that can also be seen through its perspective. You can follow those lines on the ground and the ones on the walls to the vanishing point, which is right on the hand that holds the swords in the center. He also used color to emphasize the importance of the people in the front against all the colors in the background because the building and the surroundings, they're all in these browns and grays and they're quite muted colors. So the people in their more colorful clothing and with their shiny helmets and swords and stuff, they stand out much more and they're brought more to the front. And then, of course, there's the story of being rational over being emotional, civic duty over personal considerations such as love or friendship. And we can see that in the strong figures on the left and all their determination and their strong muscles. And then the contrast with the women on the right that are all downcast and crying. They're also physically lower than the heroes on the left. All their shapes are sort of rounded in contrast to the almost angular robustness of the men on the left. And it brings to mind a lot of those enlightenment ideas that kept stressing how weak women were because they were all about emotions and men were strong because they were all about being rational. And of course, the true virtue that they are celebrating here is patriotism over everything. And there's a telling little detail that amongst a group of crying women, we see this little boy who looks up at his grandfather and his father and uncles with such admiration. Now, there's always the speculation of why he chose this subject, mainly when we think of the development of politics in France over the years after 1785, and of course the role that David himself would play in that. I mean, of course, the revolution. And David was to become very active in the revolutionary movement. He became a member of the National Assembly, and he would eventually be one of the people who voted for the execution of the king. But the thing is, we know that revolution was already in the air for years before the storming of the Bastille. In fact, it had been since the American Revolution almost a decade before. So did he see this Roman subject and realize that the Romans eventually would kick out their king and became a republic? And that obedience to the state does not mean obedience to the king per se? Or was he just simply doing a royal commission in a new and exciting style? To be honest, I don't think we'll ever really know. Now, there's one more little story that I want to tell you about this painting, and that's the influence it had in the years after it was made. During the 18th and 19th century, the interest in the life and times of Romans would only grow. This was partly due, of course, to the discoveries made in Pompeii, because that taught us so much more about daily life in Rome. And people started to speculate about all kinds of little details of Roman life. For instance, how did the Romans greet each other? And in several plays during the 19th century, they used this salute, the one of the Horatii, as a way of Romans saluting one another. And over time, people started to think that that's actually how the Romans did that. And to be clear, we have no idea how Romans saluted or greeted one another. Although we know they said Ave, which, which more or less means hail. But it became one of those things that people associated with the Roman salute. And because it was thought of as the real Roman salute, people started to use it for various purposes. Some countries even adopted it as an official salute that had to be done at certain points. And it may surprise you that the first country to do so was the United States. All the way back in 1892, they introduced the Bellamy salute that was to accompany the Pledge of Allegiance in schools. So children had to say this Pledge of Allegiance and raise their right arm with their hand extended, palms down and fingers closed. Now, I'm sure you know that in the 1920s and 30s, several political movements, namely the fascists and the Nazis, adopted this same salute, which is why eventually in the US they stopped using it and it was replaced with the hand over heart gesture. And this is apparently done through something called the flag code and it wasn't amended until 1942. So I suppose that up until that time, children made this salute even in the US. But the more distressing point is that this painting may well have been the origin of the Nazi salute, which I guess is less surprising if you realize the story behind it, because of course, blind obedience to the state is one of the central principles of fascism. I mean, they based their whole movement on the worst ideas the Romans had ever come up with. And their version of the salute, 
I'm sure you're familiar with it. I'm not going to show it to you. Just pictures of it make my blood boil, so I won't bother. I'm sure you get the picture. But that version means raising your right arm with the palm down and the fingers closed, but also keeping your heels together. And if we look back at the painting, that's not what they're doing. In this case, the three brothers step forward. And by the way, only one of them raises his right hand. The other two raise their left hand. So, unsurprisingly, the Nazis got it wrong, because when did the Nazis ever get anything right? Anyway, with that somewhat strange detour, let's get back to the painting, which would become extremely influential in the development of the style of neoclassicism. And today you can still see it in the Louvre in Paris, and it's actually on display in one of the rooms that was used for the salon where it was first exhibited. Of course, alternatively, you could go to the Toledo Museum of Art in Toledo, Ohio, to see the second version. But before you head off to Paris or Toledo, I'd like to thank you very much for watching and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Bye.